Oh, it's so good to be. It's so good to be in the house of God, amen. I wanna tell you that, you know that um, the design of the temple is interesting. When you look at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, there's a specific layout to it, but you know that actually they had different entrances and exits, and you could never enter through the same gate, exit through the same gate that you entered. So if you came through the northern gate, you would have to exit through the southern gate. Now, let's first of all address something. I know many of you were stuck in traffic this morning, okay? And I wanna say to you, I am sorry that you got stuck in traffic, but I'm not sorry that we haven't seen attendance like this in years. And I'm not sorry that people's lives are getting changed. And I'm not sorry that God is moving. I recognize it's inconvenient, and I apologize for that, but we might not be the church for you if all you're interested in is leaving on time. We want you leaving touched by the presence of God, changed, amen? I mean, we can wait hours to get into a a soccer match, right? A sports match. But you know what? There's nothing like time with our heavenly Father in his house, okay? But they designed the temple with entrances and exits, and hey, we're we're trusting God for some favor with the council. We want to open up some more exits and things to make way for bigger crowds, which we're believing are going to keep growing in Jesus' name. But, um, you know, the temple was designed in Jerusalem that you would come in through one gate and leave through the gate that you were facing. Now, that's good for traffic flow, come in one and leave through the other, But that's also a picture that God never wants you leaving the same way you came. And I believe today you are not going to leave the same way that you came in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get to the word for today. I know that I have other announcements to make, but Jesus is more important. And you are not here for announcements. You're here for an encounter with him. We are continuing our conversation around what God has laid on our hearts as a church and We had this picture of God launching a rocket, but we had God emphasize to us to place ourselves on a firm foundation. A foundation is everything to a structure. You can have the nicest structure in the world, but if it does not have a solid foundation, it will collapse. If it does not collapse now, when the storms come, it will. And we want you to know that God has a foundation in mind for you to build your life on. And I believe today you are going to hear all about that foundation, although it might be something you may have never heard, I will show you from Scripture that there is a specific foundation God wants you to build your life upon. And when you build your life upon that foundation, no matter what comes your way, right, You don't just survive the storm. You don't just get by, but actually when the enemy attacks, he loses ground, right? That's the kind of foundation that God wants to put in you. So today I wanted to speak to you from the subject, this is love. Now you're ready, listen, just just hang in with me for a moment, everybody, please. Okay, because I'm not talking about love how you know it. I'm not talking about the love that you think you know. You think because you have someone you love in your life, you know love. No, you don't know love. In fact, people can never offer you the love that God is talking about. See, it's interesting to me that that people would say, I know what love is, but actually human love is conditional. And the interesting thing to me is actually God has a love for you that you could not understand. And I pray today you will get a picture into it, but actually it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you because it is so foreign to human minds. In fact, the closest kind of love is a love you would have, but it's, it's, it's a love that you would possess. But God even says, in fact, in his scripture, if you have this kind of love, I have it far greater. So as we speak about love today, I'm not talking about peace and love. I'm not talking about tolerance and acceptance. I'm talking about an identity that has been given to you by the almighty God of heaven. And an identity that you didn't work for, that you didn't earn. An identity based on his goodness, not your goodness. Based on his love for you, not your love for him. 
If we go into scripture, it's interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, verse 13, and now abide. Faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. So God recognizes three things do exist. That you can have faith, you can have hope, and you can have love, but actually one is the greatest. One is superior. One is of more power, of more significance. And the Bible highlights love. Now many of you that might have grown up in church, you would think God would highlight faith. The Bible says, hey, listen, you know, uh, we don't live by our natural sight. We don't live by what we see, we live by faith, right? That, that in fact, we have a life of faith. We run this race of faith. So often people would say, my faith is strong. That's a person of great faith. We see people moving and doing things. Oh, wow, they have great faith. Faith that can even move mountains. But that's not actually the greatest, although it's great. The Bible says that love is the greatest. In fact, in Galatians chapter five, it says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Now, at the time of this writing, there are two groups, Jew and Gentile. And what it's highlighting is in Christ Jesus, whether you are physically circumcised or physically uncircumcised, if you have believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as Messiah, right? Whether you are Jew or Gentile is not significant anymore. But what? But faith, right? But faith working through love. It's insignificant where you come from. Now you're in Christ, what is most significant is faith works. But faith can only work through love. Now this is not talking about your love for God. Because your love for God, although it may be there at times, it isn't perfect. It's failing. It falls short. Some moments you feel like, man, I love you, Lord. And some moments you feel like, I don't even know who the Lord is. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Your love is great on a Sunday, not so great on a Monday, not so great on a Tuesday. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Or your love was great waking up for church and then you showed up and there was a traffic jam and the love just kept. The love for God, oh my goodness, it's hot, it's a waste of time. But the love God wants you to live from is unlimited and it's perfect. And it is fully devoted to you in Christ Jesus. And it is so powerful that only once you have it can you function by faith. Faith cannot work by works. You cannot by yourself determine to have faith. Faith scripturally can only work after love is received, after love is believed, right? And so what's so interesting is we sang today this powerful song, your name is the greatest. Your name has all powerful, is all authority. Your name stands above it all. Now, in the Old Testament, right, we have the names of God, powerful names of God. God Most High, God Almighty, God our Healer, God our Provider, God our Peace. We have all the names of God, but do you know one name of God was not yet revealed until Jesus came? Jesus says in the book of John, I have revealed your name to all people, and by your name, I have kept my disciples. The language there in the Greek, it's not Jesus saying, through your name, the disciples have been hanging around. Jesus says, because of this name that I have revealed of God to people, and in the faith in that name, my disciples have been kept. The language there is not kept slaves, kept hostage. It's actually 
protected, provided for, healthy. Do you know there is no record in Scripture of the disciples in Christ's ministry while he was with them, no record of them being sick, no record of them being harmed. Yes, they were in a storm that could have sank them, but the storm had no authority. Yes, they were in a place where there was no food and no one could eat, but Jesus blessed a schoolboy's lunch and fed 20,000 people with baskets left over. All the while, the disciples were with Jesus under his ministry. They were provided for and protected by. And Jesus says, through your name, I have kept them. What is the one name of God yet to be revealed until Jesus revealed him? It was the name Abba, Father. If you want to get more accurate to culture, Daddy. In fact, when they asked Jesus how we should pray, he said, pray, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. When he told people, including the religious Pharisees and Sadducees, that you could address God as Daddy, they wanted to kill him. They took it as the ultimate heresy. How dare you call the Almighty, the All-Knowing, the All-Powerful Daddy? Why? Because Jesus came to place us in a new relationship with God, a new covenant with God. Not a covenant where God could be certain things, but where God could be what he's always desired to be towards us, and that is our dad. Why does it matter to God that we call him dad? Because dad changes everything. You know, uh, if we were together in a shop and you came to me and you said, Pastor Josh, Pastor Josh, I mean, I would recognize you in the store and I'd say, hi, nice to meet you. But I mean, it would be a cordial kind of greeting. And, and, and maybe you, you, you don't have money and you, you can't afford your groceries and you come and say, Pastor Josh, I, I don't know how to ask you this, but would you consider helping me with my groceries? And I may do so unless I detect it's a scam. <laughs> but the thing that's interesting to me is that you have access to me, but you don't have all of me. Now, my children, on the other hand, running around the same store, with the same man, with the same wallet, calling me a different name, unlocks all kinds of different emotions in me. Yeah. Huh. It, it, it's, it, it's interesting how we see it so often, like God is all those names, healer, provider, protector, almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, but the moment we get to daddy, it kind of gets strange. Because it's like, how dare I? How dare I call him dad? But what we don't realize is where the devil sees great power, he brings perversion. He, he wants you not to see God in that light. He doesn't want you to call God by that name. Because when you call God by that name, you position yourself in intimacy with him. You know, the Bible says that God is, is faithful to give those who diligently seek him some of you think seeking God looks like this. Oh God, almighty, all powerful, can I come a little closer? I'm really not having a good day, God. The pastor's got me on my knees and both my knees are sore anyway. Um, but I just really wanted to ask you, okay, I've now been praying for the last 30 minutes, okay. I haven't thought once about all my problems. Well, I have, but I'm gonna pretend I haven't. I'm seeking you, God. That is not the Greek word used for seek. The Greek word used for seek there is the word exoteo. I'm not even using my notes, so it's Holy Spirit speaking. Exoteo is the Greek word for to pursue with the expectation of a demand. Let me tell you something. When we go into a toy store, Joel and Hannah have exoteo faith. <laughs> Dad, Dad, where are you? Where are you? Dad, I found this, I found this. They're not seeking me considering whether I would hear them. They seek me knowing he's the one who will pay for it. He loves me. He cares for me. 
Do you know my children have never once asked what things cost? They don't care. We're trying to teach them to value money, and it's important you do. But that's not how they approach daddy. No, no, daddy's, if I get to daddy, I get to resource. If a child is on a playground and they're getting bullied, they can call the manager of the playground, they can call the teacher. But let me tell you something, if daddy's nearby and daddy hears, dad, that bully has a problem. Because dad's not gonna deal like a teacher with the situation. Dad's gonna deal like a parent in that situation. And Jesus says to us, this is the relationship I now give you. This is what I came for. Not just to make you knowing of God, but to become a part of the family of God. It's so much more than just knowing God. It's knowing that you're his child. The Bible says literally, if you parents love your kids this way, how much more, and give them things, how much more? more, meaning you don't even through your kids. You know, let me tell you something. You love your children in a special way. It's a different kind of love. It's a different kind of love. It's a love that just says, man, this is just the greatest. I just love this little child so much. I don't know what to do with myself. You know, sometimes we even preach about salvation in a way that makes God look like a God, but not a dad. And we say, well, what if someone says I'm angry at God? then they're cut off. I, I don't know, I, I can't judge that situation, but I can tell you this. When my children come to me at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years of age and say, that's it, I'm done. I want out of this house. It's unfair, it's not nice, I'm leaving. And they go and they pack their bags. As a dad, I don't go and say, well, that's it now. That's it. You know, they've said they're leaving. They've said they're done. Okay, Tara, what do you think? Well, I think they've said it now that they've said it. We have to listen to it, and we have to allow it to be their reality. So let's take them now, pack their bags, take them to the street corner, and leave them be. Take, take all communication, all money, everything that's ours, they're on their own forevermore. No. Okay, we let them pack their bags and they go to the door. We even let them walk to the border of the property and stand at the gate. And they're leaving, they're done. And then we let them think about the decision for some time. Get hungry, get hot in the sun, get thirsty. Realize, oh my goodness, my Xbox is inside. My sweets are inside, right? Right, but, but, but we even protect them, even in their rebellion, we're thinking of ways, are they okay? Are they, are they gonna get sunburned? Have they got something to drink? Like, because why? We're not, we're not cut off from them because we didn't love them because they loved us. We don't love them because they loved us. No, we love them because they came from us. I mean, the moment that child is born, love shows up in your heart that was never there. And it manifests itself. I'll never forget when we had Jonathan Tara and I were, I mean, I had the thought at least, how am I gonna love another child as much as this child? And I thought, God, I wonder how you love so many of your children. Until the moment came when Joel showed up. And in the moment, the love wasn't divided, it was multiplied. More love showed up, equal amounts, but more in total. Then we're like, my goodness, how can we love anyone more than our two sons? And along came the little princess, Hannah Grace, right? and dad's heart melted. But more love showed up, right? It is love, not that we love God, but he loves us in 1 John chapter four, verses 10, it says, this is love. 1 John four, verses 10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, very big English word, for our sins, the payment. We love him, but thank goodness, that's not what we depend on. That's not what our faith rests on. That's not what our effort is dependent on. That's not what our fruit is dependent on. No, his love for us is where there's great power. Oh, pastor, show me that in scripture. Well, Jesus goes into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. 
He goes into the wilderness to be tempted on our behalf. You know, Jesus' life is for us. And in that season of testing, the Bible tells us he is in the wilderness 40 days and nights. And the wilderness in Israel is real wilderness, everybody. It's not even wilderness like we have here in Africa where there's trees and there's shade and there's a river. The wilderness in Israel is basically a desert. Anyone here knows that you cannot live in the desert longer than a couple of days without water and food. Maybe two, maybe three. 40 is a long time. Jesus was going through a supernatural payment for you and I. Yes, it's wise for us to fast. Yes, it's wise for us to be conscious of things getting in the way of us. And we should live fasted lives, meaning what is robbing my peace and my joy right now? Is it social media? Is it politics? Right? What's robbing my peace right now? Is it alcohol? Whatever's robbing your peace, fast it and focus your eyes on Jesus, right? But you never have to fast for favor. Jesus fasted 40 days and nights for you. It was an overfast as an overpayment. You never ever are cut off from God until you fast. See, because the truth then is, if your fasting determines God blessing you, then you just need to fast until you die. Because the longer, the more blessing. The longer, the more blessing. And the longer you make it, the more your eyes are on your effort. Now, I want to show you a spiritual truth. Jesus is in the desert, and the, and the devil comes to him. And the devil always waits for the perfect time to tempt you. You know, the devil doesn't just come anytime. He waits until the timing is perfect, where you are weak, discouraged, hurt, and then he comes. And he comes on an assignment. And what's interesting is the Bible tells us in John chapter 8, verses 44. Well, let's go to 42. John chapter 8, verses 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and come from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He is a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. So we have God, the father of love and Satan, the father of lies. But he comes at the opportune time with those lies. And he knows how to get you to fail. Can I tell you how? He comes to challenge something, to remove something, to take something from you. Because he knows if he can remove something from you, he has you trapped. Now the devil cannot attack and destroy believers. People who have believed in Jesus and have been saved by his grace are now a part of the kingdom of God, his bride, boys and girls, sons and daughters, and the devil cannot come and attack you, right? But the devil can come and lie to you, and he needs you to believe his lies before he can control your circumstances and take authority over you. He can't show up and take authority over you. He has to show up and let you hear his lie, and the moment you believe it and receive it, now he has authority. Jesus doesn't call the devil, hey, hey, our, our great uh, um, attacker. He says he is what? The great deceiver that comes with accusations. He makes statements, and he wants you to believe him. So when Jesus is in the wilderness, the devil comes, and he says to Jesus, when Jesus is starving, hungry, thirsty, and exhausted, 40 days and nights in the desert without anything for us. And he comes and he says, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, then prove it. Take this rock, turn it into bread. If you are the son of God, do something to prove it and sort out your situation. And Jesus turns to the devil 
<clears throat> and he says something so interesting. He says, I don't live by bread and bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So Jesus did not say, I don't live by bread and bread alone. I, I live by all the scriptures written, although the scriptures are given for us to hear God. Jesus gave a specific reference. He says, devil, I don't need natural bread. I have heavenly bread to overcome temptation. That heavenly bread came to me and fills me and feeds me when God spoke over my life. There's only one place in Jesus' life that is recorded prior to that moment, quite, quite quickly actually, quite recently before that moment, where it is recorded that God spoke audibly over Jesus. Do you know where that moment was? When he got baptized. And out of heaven, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now look at the devil's tactics. If you are the son. What word did he leave out? Because if he says, you are the most loved son of God, well then you're gonna be fine. You don't need to feed yourself. You don't need to prove yourself. God's gonna take care of you. So many of you don't believe God loves you. You believe he loves the church. You believe he loves that famous person, that person, this person. But you would say, well, not me. Why? Because I haven't been behaving so good, pastor. My life, you don't understand. My life doesn't look Christian at all. My life looks far from Christian right now. Well, what's interesting is Jesus got those words from heaven before he did any miracle. God spoke from heaven, son, before your ministry begins, function from this authority. You are loved and already pleasing. See, can you feel the Holy Spirit in the room? He's telling you, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And you know what? Some of you at the moment, you say, I can't hear the voice of God. I haven't heard the voice of God. I don't know the voice of God. I was thinking about that the other day because some people say, I've never heard God. Now, to be honest with you, God has never opened the heavens and said, Josh, and if he did, I pray there's grace on that moment because I might panic pretty badly because um, I would think it's quite a loud sound and it's quite significant. He's spoken through me through the inward witness and through his word and through the Holy Spirit's leading, but I've never had him speak audibly. But what's interesting is uh, recently, about two years ago, our, our youngest child, Hannah, I think she was about five, she was fascinated with heartbeats. I don't know, she was just, you know, she obviously maybe at school heard about it. So she wanted to hear my heartbeat. So she was like, Dad, I want to hear your heart. I'm like, okay. So she came over to me. I was sitting on the couch. She sat on my lap and she put her ear to my chest. She was listening. And then Tara called me from the other side of the house. And I remember responding because she was saying, Josh, Josh. So I said, yes. And Hannah jumped up. I said, what's up? She said, your voice. It's so loud. See, when you put your head close to the heart of God, right, you can hear his voice. But the father of lies comes in and he says, you can't lean into God because you haven't done enough. You haven't worked enough. You haven't earned enough. So the devil puts it on your performance, which is always lacking. Funny, some people will say, Pastor, I prayed an hour. All you need to do is find someone who prays for two. And immediately you go, God's not gonna hear my prayers. <laughs> Pastor, I fasted, I fasted a whole week on the Daniel fast. And all you need to hear is someone else fasted food. And you're like, you fasted food? I remember asking a pastor once, what do you fast? And he said, everything. I went, everything? Because you know, we find these fasts that we can kind of make. 
you know, come on, let's be honest with ourselves, right? Nothing wrong with fasting, but the moment it's on your performance, it's not good enough. And God says, this is love. Not that you love me, but that I love you. That I love you. In fact, in 1 John chapter 4, it says in verse 19, we love him because he first loves us. Because he first loves us. So even having love for God is in response to his love for you. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. Like, I, I, you know, I mean, okay, fine. I, I'm okay with that. But what happens if I don't do that good? What happens if I make a mistake? Well, you know what's interesting is I, I, I remember watching the Olympics. And um, at the same time that Usain Bolt was about to break the world record for the 100 meter sprint again, again, um, everyone was so excited in anticipation, and I still think it's the fastest time anyone's ever run 100 meters. But as he did that, the entire world erupted and celebrated that this was the greatest human run for 100 meters in history. Unquestionably, the greatest feat. Around that time, our, one of our children was learning to walk. And I'll never forget sitting in the lounge, watching our child start to take their first steps with this big eyes and scared as anything but knowing, okay, dad's got me. And as he started to stumble forward, you know, like this, literally, it's a very, it's, it's very kind to call it a walk. It's an assisted fall forward. You know, they fall forward, but the feet just manage to somehow get in front of them. But, but you, you, have you ever watched people say that their children took their first step and you don't want to tell them that's technically not a step. That's technically a fall, right? Man, I was so proud. I couldn't care what Usain Bolt did. It had no level of excitement for me. It was like, my child is walking and this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. See, to a parent, it's not a performance. Parents love their kids in special ways. I mean, if your child is on a sports team and he is the worst player on the team, what do you say? Just playing is precious. Just getting out there is awesome. That's what a parent says, not what a coach says, not what a boss says. It's not performance-based, it's love-based. It's love-based, right? <clears throat> so, it, in this, I mean, even God actually wants us to see that although God wants you to be used in a mighty way and your life to just have his signature and his fingerprint, it doesn't happen without first functioning from his love. Why? Because God is jealous for you. Imagine if I set up a life for my child that they can live without my love. I rob myself of loving them and I rob them of letting me spoil and love them, right? The worst thing to a parent is their child is going to leave and make a new life somewhere else, and you're not gonna see them and be able to hug them, and hey, the mom's in here right now, like, yes, my, my child's at university in Cape Town, and I don't know, and they're overseas. And why? Because your love for them is so big, you're like, I just wanna be around. I just wanna take care of them. I just wanna look after them. No matter how old they get, they're still your child, right? It's like, I just, I have a love for you and I just want that love to be around, to protect you, to take care of you. Why? Because I love you so much. Yes, I want you to accomplish things in life, but I'd never set up a life where I'd rob myself of the opportunity of loving you. And God, literally, based on his love, saw us under the law cut off from covenant with him. And he said, I have to redeem this relationship to its original form, to its real purpose. And the Bible tells us in John chapter three, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. For God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn you, but that through Jesus, he would save you and redeem you, and bring you not just from a servant, 
identity, but into the sonship identity. You know, when we baptize people in water, I mean, I only heard this recently and it just, oh, just touched my heart so much. You know, we would baptize people and what do we say? We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So we go, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, if you read the original Greek, that's not what it says. It says, we baptize you into the family name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, it's a big difference to saying, hey, you will know. I mean, okay, let's think. Who's the richest person in the world right now? I don't know. Okay, Elon Musk, we'll go with Elon. Okay, Elon Musk. It's one thing saying, right, hey, we, we, we baptize you, we, we give you money, right, on behalf of Elon Musk and his companies. There's a big difference between that to we make you a Musk. Listen to me. That's what Jesus was sent to do, to make you God's family, right? To give you the grace of God and redeem you into the relationship as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Amen? I want to ask if, uh, if a, a seat can come out right now. I want to illustrate to you a passage in Scripture where Jesus was talking about Father God, talking about God the Father specifically. And he says about God the Father, he talks about him and he gives a very real illustration. Now, Jesus was not talking about a natural person alive at the time around Jesus. He says, a certain man, and he starts to illustrate this dad, and he's speaking about our heavenly Abba. So we're going to go there, Luke chapter 15, verses 11, and it tells us, Jesus is speaking, and he says, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, say them. So some people have heard this story and never heard. At that moment, he didn't give the one son his inheritance. He gave them both their inheritance. You don't come into inheritance until someone is declared dead. And when someone's declared dead, their assets have to be divided accordingly. And we'll keep talking about this next week because there's a whole other passage to this that'll blow your mind. But so what's so interesting is the younger son says, Dad, right? I don't want to be your son anymore. So I need you to die so I can leave your house with the possessions you want to give me. That doesn't sound like a nice conversation, does it? But the dad, you see, you notice something in this passage of scripture? The sons have free will. So the dad can't say no. He goes, if you, if you insist, fine, I'll do that. So the dad then literally legally dies gives that son his possessions. He gathers everything and he goes to a far country. And in the far country, he wastes his possessions with prodigal living. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and began to be in want. So he takes his money and he goes and he pursues. He pursues what he thought he didn't have in the house. He thinks if I chase stuff, and prodigal living there basically says, if you could think of anything debaucherous and gluttonous and lustful, that's what he went. He took all the money and he said, I'm gonna try and indulge and I'm gonna try and fill the hole in my soul with everything I can find. And then what happens? He spends it all because there's no blessing on it. It's just, it's just, he's being robbed. He's been taken from. And what happens is he finds himself in want. And the word there for want is great suffering great suffering. Then what do we do when we find ourselves with our money not fulfilling us? He went in the next verse, 15, and joined himself to a citizen of that country. That word therefore joined is he cleaved himself. It's not like, hey, how are you doing? Nice to know you. Can I have a job? He actually went into a relationship with that person. I'm not saying physically. I'm saying he position himself. When you cleave to someone, it means you cling to them. You hold to them. So he said, the stuff is gone, but maybe a person can save me. 
For some of you, you've been looking for love in people. And I have to tell you this, even in the best relationships, people cannot love you the way you need to be loved. You see, you need to be loved by the Father, and then from that love, you don't need love, but then you can love others, irrespective of whether they deserve your love, irrespective of whether they've earned your love. You can love people when they let you down, only if you have first received the love of the Father. All right, so he goes to a person and he says to that person, please, please, would you help me? Please, would you give me, I, I, I'm desperate. And what does the person do? The person sends him into the fields to feed the pigs. Now this is a Jewish son. They cannot even be under the law near pigs. He is sent into the worst job, the most humiliating role ever. I mean, my heart breaks right now. I think of people in prostitution and all kinds of things. You go to people and you say, help me live, help me survive, and you find yourself with someone who's only interested in taking advantage of you. Yeah. Only interested in making you be the absolute least. And you know what's worse is he sends him to feed the pigs. And he's starving. And he says, please, can I have something to eat? And that person says, nope. You're not even allowed to eat the food that you feed the pigs. When you place your faith in people, especially the wrong people, I'm not talking right now about your spouses and that, I'm talking about when you see someone out there, the devil will send you someone, you gotta be very careful. You'll put your pearls in a place, you'll give your heart, you'll give your life, and people, the wrong person will take advantage of you. And what they will do is they'll push you down into the lowest lows. Not only do you have to feed the pigs, you're not even allowed to eat their food. Now, there are two fathers in the story, do you know that? Just one is hidden. There is the father in the house, the father of love, but there's also the father of lies. How do we know that the father of lies is talking? Because the son came forward and said to the father, you're dead to me, give me my stuff and let me leave. Something else was influencing him. You'll have a better life out there. There's more opportunity out there. There will people out there, they'll take care of you. They'll look after you. They'll give you what you want. He didn't leave on his own. He had been influenced to leave. He wasn't listening to his father. He was listening to the father of lies. And it tells us in verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, dad, I've sinned against you and before heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you just make me a slave and let me eat because at least your slaves get food? Now we're gonna do for this illustration, our uh, very own Pastor Cabello is gonna be the prodigal son today. And uh, we love him so much. Mighty man of God, amen. And uh, he is kind of a prodigal, it's powerful. Amen. Clean 21 years, praise God, hey. What a testimony. So, this is not a picture of what, you've, what you will do, okay? This is not prophetic about anything. You're in the house. But for the sake of the illustration, he's taking that role, okay? He's humbling himself. So prodigal takes the money, leave, go your way. Off he goes, done with dad. I'm finished with dad. I want nothing to do with dad. I'm over dad, right? And he heads his own way. And he goes in his prodigal living and he thinks he'll find fulfillment in the stuff out there, in the substances out there, in the places out there. But the more he looks, the less he finds, right? And he stops, he's starving. And he thinks to himself, I'm starving, but my dad's slaves, his servants, they eat food every day. What if I could go home and ask him just for some food and I'll be a slave? Now, repentance, listen to me. Repentance in the story is not modeled how you think it is. You think the son was sorry. He wasn't sorry for what he did to the dad. He was sorry for the consequences of his choices. But dads don't care. Dads care 
that you'll let them love you again, help you again. So hold on. He says, I can at least eat at home. Now, many people out there, many people out there right now, they're just asking questions like, if there's a God, he would do something. If there's a God, he would, if you even exist, I know I'm not worthy, I'm not. Now that is not full repentance because repentance is knowing who you are in God, which we'll see later when God shows how he truly sees the son. But the son does start to think of the house. Some of you watching online haven't been in the house of God for a long time. God's not condemning you. He's saying, come back, right? But you start to be in lack and want and you say, well, maybe in the house there's space for me, but I'm not worthy. But the son is not sorry for what he did to the dad. He's just sorry for the consequences of his decisions. And he says, you know what? I'm gonna go home, right? So in verse 20, he's now stopped. He's now thought of the father's house. He's now looking back at dad's house and he turns around and he starts his journey back, okay? So take a few steps, now stop. We often hear, if you come one step, God will come one step. You know, he'll meet you halfway. He'll meet you halfway. Well, that's not in scripture. What Jesus said about the father is he said, he arose and he came to his father. Now, the dad was very wealthy because God is describing the heavenly father, right? He's the heavenly father of all resource. And wealthy men in those days, they didn't need to move around and harvest and work the fields. They had servants for that. So they would just sit and relax inside. But this Bible tells us something very interesting. It says, when the sun was a great way off, his father saw him. The only way the dad would see the son starting to come home is if the dad had been sitting and waiting and staring in the direction in which his son left. I could imagine the dad sitting in the sunlight, in the heat, saying, give me shade, but I'm gonna keep looking. I'm gonna keep waiting. I'm gonna keep praying. I'm gonna keep hoping. And at night time, give me a lantern, shine a light for my son to come home. Make a way. And the Bible says, when the father saw him, what did he have? Compassion. You know what the father of lies tells you? When God sees you in a situation of brokenness, God is condemning you. No, he's not. The Bible tells us he condemned all our sin in the body of Jesus Christ. He does have an emotion towards you in your brokenness, but it's only compassion. His heart breaks. His heart breaks that you are in brokenness and bondage. And then it tells us something about the dad. The son has taken a few steps, but the dad sees him. The dad is moved with compassion. What's that? His love for the son. He stands. Now, all wealthy men back in those days had long robes, right? And wealthy people never run. All right? For those of you who are running this pastor, it's, 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 it's a joke, okay. I'll take that as a word from the Lord for me. Thank you, Jesus, okay. But they didn't run in those days, ever. It was a sign of being undignified. It was a sign of like, you, 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 you. it was, it, and what the dad does, he's moved with love. He kicks off his shoes. He picks up his robe and he says, I see you, son. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm coming. And he jumps onto the sun. And the Bible says, he kisses him, not once, but repeatedly he's going, no, 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 I've missed you, I've missed you. I've missed you so much. I love you so much. I see you, I have you, I have you, I have you. Do you know what the son starts doing? He starts his speech. He says, dad, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm not worthy to be able to be your son. I have done bad things. I have sinned. I've let you down. I've done those things. But the Bible also records what the father does. The father absolutely ignores the son's speech. Because the son is not being redeemed upon his behavior. 
The son is not being restored based on his effort. The son is not being treated based on his actions. The son is being loved by the father's love. And the father says in verse 22 to the servants, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. What is that the robe of? Righteousness. Right? He says, here is the ring. The ring in those days was like your bank account. You would have a family emblem. You would dip it in wax and you would pay your bills. He immediately redeems him to the family's resources. And he says, put sandals on his feet because feet was a picture of your past and where you had been. And even in typology, when Boaz wanted to redeem Ruth, he had to get her sandal over her life and bring the sandal, giving him right to redeem, that's my wedding ring, thank you. <laughs> to redeem Ruth, he had to come with the sandal. It is the redemption of everywhere those feet had been, in the pigsty, amongst what comes out of pigs as well. It doesn't care, I'm putting sandals on his feet. This speaks of the new covenant. Do you know under the law, God says, take your sandals off, for where you stand is holy ground. But in grace, in Christ Jesus, God says, put on the sandals I give you. You are a son of God in the presence of a holy God, right? See, it's all about surrendering to the love of God and let Him minister to you Amen. through the work of Jesus and say, this is who you are by my effort, by my design, by my resource. Well, pastor, how could he get back more money? Because God never runs out of resource. <laughs> he never runs out of inheritance. There's enough to go around for everybody, you know? But it's a complete picture of restoration, amen? amen. Thanks, Pastor Cabello. Hey. And I saw this one last thing. Because in the scriptures earlier, we read that God sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save him. In this picture, you have Father God as the dad at home. But the moment he sees his son, he sends Jesus. And he sent Jesus into your darkest pit, into your deepest brokenness, into your most harsh disease, he sent his son so that through his son, he could bring you home and redeem you into the family name. This is love. This is the love your heavenly father has for you today. We're gonna sing a song right now. And in this moment, I wanna encourage you to just, you can stand up, be seated. I don't know how you move, but I know this. Whatever you're facing today, however you're feeling, whatever you're in lack of today, let me tell you something. Yes, God is Jehovah our healer, Jehovah our peace. But as daddy God, you have access to that already. He is your dad. In this moment, I believe you can just receive his love for the deepest wounds, for the harshest hurts, for the biggest bondages. You are not in the place you are alone. You know that God is omnipresent, omniscient, meaning He sees everything, He is everywhere. You might feel far, but if you put your eyes on the Father, He is right there to swoop in and save. So Lord Jesus, I thank You in this moment as we worship God, You would move amongst Your people, amongst Your children and touch them and let them know You are their dad. Speak to them, touch them, heal them, set them free. I break every curse of every sickness, every bondage, every depression, every oppression, every person that has come into their lives to abuse them in their childhood, to misuse them, to mistreat them. That is not the love they are to be dependent on today. The love of God in Christ Jesus replaces that brokenness, redeems that hurt, redeems that loss. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your love flow in this place. He loves you. He loves you so much. 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 God loves you so much. He loves you, your heavenly father, your daddy, your Abba. 
He loves you so much. Thank you, Jesus, that people feel your love in this place today. Wash them, cleanse them, heal them, restore them. Thank you, Jesus. In this moment right now, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I believe there are people here today. You've heard about this heavenly Father, you've heard about this God, but the truth is you don't know Him. You know about Him maybe, but in the service today, you said, I don't, I don't know Him like that. I don't have a relationship with God like that. I might know about a God, I might know He might even be connected to Jesus, but I don't know Him. I've never leaned on his chest and heard his heartbeat and received his words for me. You're not in this place by mistake today. You're here in this place by design. God has brought you into his house to invite you to become a part of his family. He's already died for you on the cross, but he waits with heaven that you would respond because you have free will. He can't force you to receive his love, but wow, does he want you to receive it. Maybe you've never ever prayed a prayer in your life to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. This is the moment of salvation for you. That prayer is what unlocks Abba, Heavenly Father, and releases Him to save you in Christ Jesus. You can't live this life by being a good person. You're not good enough. That's why He came to live this life perfectly, to die for you to make you worthy through His cross, through His death and His resurrection. He brings you into the family of God if you would let Him. Maybe you're here today and you did pray that prayer one time as a kid or a long time ago and you say, but truthfully, Pastor, my life is a complete mess. I am completely 100% nowhere. I don't know Him like that, but I sense Him drawing me near. I can feel in my soul, I am looking for love in all the wrong places. Today is your day of salvation. Today is your day to come home. Today is your day to let Daddy God swoop into your life and save you. So I wanna ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. If you're in this place today and you're in any of those two categories, you've never prayed this prayer before, but you know this is the day. God didn't bring you here to leave the same way you came. No, no, no. He wants to save you, deliver you and set you free. Or maybe you're here today and you have a religious background, but the truth is, You don't know God like that and you're wondering and you're lost and you're just in the house of God today saying, that's what I want, that's the relationship I want. Well, this prayer is for you. This is such a special moment. You know, the Bible says all of heaven waits to rejoice if one person repents. Now, another voice shows up. He's speaking to you, the father of lies. And he says, what will people think? What are your friends gonna think? Are you gonna be embarrassed? Are you gonna be ashamed? Maybe he says to you, you're not good enough. You're not good enough to be a Christian. You have this addiction. You have that brokenness. You have this past. Those are lies. You're never good enough to have what Jesus died to give you. In fact, the only thing humanity can give God without Christ is their sin. And it's the only thing he wants. Give me that so that I can redeem you. Your heavenly father is speaking louder than the father of lies. And he says, come today receive me, receive me, and I would change your life. So if in any of those two categories, whilst nobody's looking around, just me, you say, Pastor, that's me. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me right now. Raise your hand, say, Pastor, that's me. I wanna pray this prayer. Hands are going up all over this place, all over this place. Hands are going up. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. Right now, lift your hand. Yes, that's me. Yes, sister, yes, sister. Yes, sir, yes, sister. That's you, yes, brother. Yes, that's you, that's you. Yes, 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 yes. Once you've raised your hand, you can put it down. Has anybody else not raised their hand? But you know, it's for you one last time. If you haven't raised your hand yet, raise it now. Yes, in the back. Yes, yes, all the way in the back. All the way, yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now you can put your hands down. Now this is the best part ever. We get to pray this prayer, show the devil he's a loser, declare you a child of God right here at the altar in front of this house of God. You get prayed over and declared a son and a daughter of the Most High God for eternity. So if you raised your hand, If you're with someone who raised their hand and your family, you also are welcome to come. And if you have not raised your hand, but you still know this is for you, any of those three categories, get out from your seat, come down to the front right now, and we are gonna pray this prayer and your life will never be the same in Jesus' name.
Come on, this is the greatest party in the house of God. All of heaven is celebrating right now. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, all the way in the back, we'll wait. Many of you raise your hands in the back, keep coming. Keep coming, we'll wait as long as it takes. This is your moment, this is your hour. Salvation is yours in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Praise God, just keep clapping, this is awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody that raised their hand, keep coming. We'll wait as long as it takes. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God, thank you, Jesus. Keep coming, we'll wait as long as it takes. Keep coming. Every last person is worth it. Every last person is worth it. Praise God, young people are coming forward. Families are coming forward. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, keep coming, keep coming. We'll wait as long as it takes. Yes, thank you, sister. You're valuable and precious. Yes, all the way in the back, praise God. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother, amen. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. Praise God. Yes. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Wow. How much He loves you. How much He loves you. How much He loves you. He went to the cross and the Bible says He endured such pain, such suffering. Do you know that no human being has been able to live through what Jesus went through. They would either die at the whipping or then die at the carrying. No one ever went through that level of suffering. And the Bible says he endured such great suffering, right, with joy set before him. What joy was in front of Jesus when he was suffering on the cross? He saw you right here, right now. And he said, you're worth it. 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 Never let the devil ever tell you you're not worth anything because God deemed you worth his one and only son. You are worth the most valuable possession in all of heaven. That's how much he loves you. We're going to pray this prayer together right now. And as we pray this prayer, I want you to close your eyes and just see Jesus with his arms open wide, welcoming you into the family of God. And as he puts his arms around you, feel every chain, every bondage, every brokenness being melted off, being cut off, every evil word, every evil action that you've been through right now in this place, as Jesus embraces you, his love heals that, his love restores. Let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that your body was broken and your blood was shed and you gave your life for my sin, past, present, and future. When you were raised from the dead, you bought me eternal life, declared me a precious child of God, changed my destination from hell to heaven forever you are my Lord you are my Savior I am your child thank you Jesus for saving me amen